Hello everyone, this is a long-awaited episode tonight, today, or this morning, whenever you are listening and tuning in. And today we will talk about something really important, uh, how to read frequency response curves of, uh, for speakers. And uh, apart from learning this, how to do that, we will also showcase uh, views on audio speakers and see how their frequency response uh, curves uh, look like. Uh, we are going to use Stereophile's published measurements because they have published uh, hundreds of speaker reviews over the years and uh, John Atkinson has uh, painstakingly measured hundreds and hundreds of speakers. And that's a very tough process, very complicated and hard and uh, a huge thank you for John Atkinson for doing all those measurements for the benefit on the, of the entire audiophile community. So now let's first uh, take a look at the key parameters that define speakers. And uh, I think there's uh, three key parameters. One of them is the frequency range, uh, the frequency measurements of the speakers. Uh, the second is the impedance measurements, and we have the phase. And uh, these three are, are really critical, and, and I, I liken them to a three-legged chair. So each of these, the frequency, impedance, and phase, are one leg of that, that chair. And if there's problem with one leg, then the whole building topples over, and you have problems with the speaker. Uh, if you have all of these three correct, then you have a perfect speaker. However, there is a big, a huge problem at the audio world. And the problem is that uh, there are compromises with our current technology. So if you have the frequency response right, then you're going to have problems with either impedance or phase or both of them. If you have the phase correct for the entire range you can reproduce, you are going to have frequency range issues. And if your impedance is perfect, then that probably works only for a really limited frequency range. So that usually happens uh, for one or two octaves region that can be produced at, at perfect impedance. Or if you have uh, certain... Um, speaker designs like uh, planner speakers uh, then then you can have the impedance uh, more constant but then you will have uh, sensitivity issues so so anyway we have our three-legged chair and uh, everything needs to be perfect to have and balanced to have balanced sound and uh, when you when you know these parameters and you know how to analyze them, then uh, even without listening to the speakers, you can tell what is the character of those speakers. And you can also tell what kind of amplifiers you can use uh, with, with, that spe with those speakers. And it's important to know that if you improve one aspect, then you introduce compromise to the other two. Unfortunately, this is how physics work, and this is the limit of our current technology of the 21st century. So when you see a new speaker coming up with something, uh, a big invention or, or something that increases the frequency range or the impedance uh, characteristics, then you can be assured that the phase is uh, suffering as a result. So... So when we look at frequency, uh, there are two uh, curves, two response curves that uh, John Atkinson uh, makes for us. And uh, one of them is the combined curve for, for the entire loudspeaker's output. So that, that shows what your speaker does. And also he prepares individual plots for for the drivers in those in that speaker. So this is also important because you can tell how those drivers are mated, how what, what the speaker's manufacturer does 
to to make them work and then if you yourself uh, build and design speakers like myself uh, then then you can learn a lot from these response curves and John also provides for us uh, impedance curves so that that tells you what the impedance of your speaker is so that means that uh, speakers they uh, do not behave just like a resistor so if your speaker was a resistor when they show uh, that your speaker is 8 ohms load then that would be perfect 8 ohms for the entire frequency range however uh, the speaker will not behave as a resistor but because it, it's a living breathing entity every frequency uh, behaves differently so so when john measures the impedance curve it means that that he goes from 10 hertz up to maybe 20 30 or even higher kilohertz uh, range to provide for us to plot the the impedance at each frequency and which can be drastically different and and there's another characteristics uh, for the impedance and is the impedance phase so it's not just important to know that uh, your speakers has an impedance of 4 ohm at 100 hertz but you also need to know what the impedance phase is and that tells you that how uh, how much of the amplifier's power your speaker can handle so if it has an impedance phase at, at zero degrees then it means that uh, if your amplifier pumps out 10 watts of driving power then your speaker will will see 10 watts coming in uh, but but if your impedance phase is off then the speakers will see less and less power so they will start to see maybe like 8 watts 5 watts and if the impedance phase is uh, more off then it can drop to below 10 percent or even less and that's that's quite frequent uh, so so when you are driving it with 10 watts at certain uh, uh, frequencies your speakers will see only one watt of power coming or maybe just 500 milliwatts even though the output is 10 watts so it's really critical to know uh, both of these values because these two will define how hard it is to drive your speakers and the third key uh, parameter is phase and unfortunately uh, phase is a really complex issue and uh, and there's no standardized uh, measurements to 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 measure all kinds of speakers uh, phase output so it's it's not something simple to do so so john doesn't do it because uh, it, it cannot be done consistently and easily even even just to measure frequency and impedance he has to use different methods sometimes for different speakers because you you cannot measure apples as, as you measure oranges and so like depending on small speaker big speaker uh, does it have a port is it the front port rear port uh, he has to use also and not just him but everyone who tries to measure speakers have to use uh, different uh, measuring uh, methods so so you also have to take this into account that that the measuring methods between speakers might vary to a certain degree and that affects uh, especially the bass uh, so so the low frequencies measurements you always need to take with a grain of salt so anything below i would say like uh, 40 hertz it's, it's it's a little subjective and that and that's not because uh, john does a poor job or people who measure phase response do a poor job it, it's because it, it, it's a tough issue there's no easy answer for it uh, let's see so here hmm, it seems that my computer is doing some some extras here let's just clear up the mess okay so going back here to the frequency response curves uh 
And on the left side, we see the frequency response curve. This is here, I just put a little bit of a blue marker right here. So here we see that's the, uh, the curve for the output for the speaker. That's the frequency response curve. And you can see that here, that's, that's the zero level. So it means that this axis here, like this axis shows uh, the amplitude and, uh, uh, and the x-axis shows the frequency. And, uh, and, and after the measurement is done, then uh, it's normalized to zero dB. So I will try to create here. So you see this line, that's zero level. So it means this is the average output level of the speaker. So for all the speakers, you will see that they, they are basically, uh, it's like up and down from the zero line. And it's because it's normalized to zero. And, um, and you see that it, uh, it, it's pretty much close to zero all over the board and, and the low end, I will mark it here, it drops, that's the base and it does because uh, the, the low frequencies are really hard to reproduce so it, it's going to drop anyway and, um, and, and the, the high frequency response, you, you see this high peak here that goes between 20 and 30 hertz it means that this speaker has a very strong uh, 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 high frequency tweeter, like a super tweeter. So it's, it's, it works up to 30k or maybe even more, uh, which is not shown in this graph. And then the lower part, the lower graph here, like right here, uh, this is the uh, output of the individual drivers. So with the blue, we see uh, the tweeter, the red shows the mid-range, and the green shows the port. And you see, let's see the, the, the tweeter's output, the blue. Uh, you see that uh, it has like ups and downs, ups and downs, and that, that's, that's usual for every tweeter. And then here we start to see a drop, and then it just drops down like that. And when you see that, that that certain slope for the drop, that will tell you what is the order of the crossover that's that's on that tweeter. And and uh, the more steep that slope is, so if it goes like more down like this, the higher order it is. So if it's a fourth order tweeter, then it will drop really suddenly. If it's a first order, it will be a gentle slope like this. And, uh, and and you see for the mid-range unit, that's, that's the red. So, so that one has a nice even slope from, uh, from about, let's say, what that is, about 60 hertz to about a kilohertz. Uh, and that's the optimal working range for, for most mid-range units. And from then on, there's, uh, there's a crossover and you, we see that the response drops here in this area now i kind of uh, put some marker on it so th there we see a little bit of unevenness let's try to delete that so we can see it there you see that there is a uh, over over here <laughs> uh, there's a little blip and that that's uh that's break up resonances of of the cone so that's why we want to put uh, a, a crossover filter on our mid-range unit because they have this breakup in their response and that's that's partly because of the mechanics of the speaker because of the size and but it's also uh, because of the the surround and spider so it's the suspension so the suspension just starts to interfere at certain frequencies and we go at uh, we see at uh, the low end it just suddenly starts to drop and that's because uh, drivers uh, lose the coupling efficiency to air below a certain frequency. And that's because uh, every body, so everything that resonates, that can give out sound, 
is most efficient at those frequencies which correspond to its size. So for example, that's why mosquitoes have that annoying sound because their body size is perfect to create 10 kilohertz to 50 kilohertz frequencies. So that's why they have that annoying really high frequency. And when you hear a bee buzzing, which is like uh, 10 times bigger than a mosquito, then you have like 10 times bigger frequencies and, and, and the bees can buzz between like uh, a kilohertz to 5 kilohertz. That's their fundamental tone for their buzz and, and it goes even to higher harmonics. And, and when you see people, or, or fundamental tones are uh, for, for males, it can go down to 80 hertz and for females it's usually uh, down to 200 hertz or so and that's because of our body size and and that's uh, uh, 100 hertz 200 hertz sound waves if if uh, we would if the sound waves were uh, ocean waves they were roughly our size and and comparable size to us and that's why we can form those sine waves because our bodies resonate at that length and when uh, when we go down to such frequencies which are really different like right let's use a different color i use red for now so when we start dropping from there uh, it means that at that region the sound uh, wavelength is very different from the driver's diameter so now uh, the driver cannot is not efficient to generate sound at those frequencies so that's why you have bigger and bigger cone excursions as the frequency drops and then you see from here on you, you see that 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 green thing here and that the port that is the ports output so it means that at that level this is when the port takes over from those frequencies which is here let's see like 30 hertz uh, down from 30 hertz and below now the port starts to dominate because uh, between uh, the ports exit and the back side of the driver which generates the pressure inside the speaker cabinet uh, then then you have that that uh, compressed air that acts as a buffer so so when you have air shooting out of the port that that air is being compressed inside the cabinet and and that can uh, couple that can transmit the the pressure and the energy to your room much more efficiently than the cone itself can so that's why we use ports but uh, let's just clear up our mess from here uh, so as you can see at, at the uh, let's see I, I will use uh, blue so the this is the port tuning frequency right here so when you see that's uh, the peak output of the port but as, as eventually you can read the exact port tuning frequency th right there you see that at, at the bottom of the mid-range units a response where it drops to the minimal right there that's where the port is tuned to and and it's so because uh that the port is most efficient there so the driver has to work very little so so the cone movement the cone excursion is lowest where the port tuning frequency is and as you go further away further away from the tuning frequency either lower or either higher than uh, your driver cone will uh, take over more of the load and essentially you have an octave above the uh, above your uh, oops it wants to go to the next page okay so powerpoint is uh, goofing up my show here so so actually uh, below and above the tuning frequency you have one octave where the port works but actually below the tuning frequency I would say more like half an octave is more realistic and on the right side we have uh, the uh, impedance curves and and the curves that's shown with the 
with the black line that's the impedance and the dotted line represents the impedance phase and the difference between the two is that uh, the black line you can read on on the left scale and on the left side of the scale I believe my screen flips the orientation so I might be pointing to the other side for you guys so anyway just read those numbers that go from uh, 0 to 20 that shows ohms and when we look at the right side it shows from minus 90 through 0 in the middle to 90 so this was on the y-axis on the x-axis we can see Hertz and uh, let's I think everyone is now bored with technicalities maybe let's just go to our next slide and we want to see uh, more of Wilson audio right so we are getting there um, so actually uh, what is really important about these uh, frequency response curves and, and phase response and impedance that uh, if you are just a beginner speaker builder then you just make it to just create as flat frequency response and the impedance will be whatever phase response you don't even know anything about it so that's how what a beginner speaker is and unfortunately most a lot of uh, speakers uh, end up that way even at the um, you know stuff that you can buy at the stores but this is the beginning and and the end of of it is when you know how to use uh, these parameters to sculpt the sound to to shape it to give it a character you want to do you want to have a pure tone or do you want to get the highest resolution so you have to know that those speakers which are extremely highly resolving they are not highly resolving because they use uh, different materials than other speakers yes they can different materials can uh, contribute to a little degree but most of the perceived resolution is because you are using frequency response and phase as a tool uh, so when you have extreme high resolution speakers their uh, output is shaped in a way to emphasize frequencies which are not naturally emphasized so your brain will pick up on those emphasized ranges and and will think that you hear more detail more result than there really is and uh, people are not consciously picking up on this the only way to learn how to pick this up whether this is happening or not is to listen to the tone does it sound like a, a real life instrument or did it tone change and that's really hard to tell because if you don't haven't heard that uh, recording live then you don't know what was that guitar's tone that was used or what was the piano's tone used or, or how the vocalist sound so maybe if you meet Diana Kroll in real life and then you hear her uh, talk or speak or sing you will be probably shocked to your core that she sounds very different from what you think after listening to her for hundreds of hours on your high-end system so there are two extremes uh, for sculpting sound for creating sound at the highest level and this is where you can grow to so if you build speakers then you will have to pick one road if you don't pick a road you will create mediocre speakers but if you pick your path and hold on to it you can create exceptional sound which will have either exceptionally correct tone so it will build on correct tone and the natural resolution you will not have uh, a high-res speaker that way it will not sound like like the king of the shows but you will get uh, a sense of freedom when you listen to those speakers it's like you are not bound to anything and 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 those speakers can take you to uncharted lands 
and and you feel like uh, you are not part of your everyday life anymore so like you go to work you pay your bills and you're tired and uh, but it it frees you up and then you get transported to a different universe you get recharged, you feel healthy, and, and your sickness is healed. It, basically, these speakers have that transformative power that they can boost you and then bring you to your next level. And um, when you look at the other extreme, which is the complex speakers, then uh, these will give you extremely high resolution. And, and then you will get higher resolution compared to attending the live event. So when you go to a live Diana Krall concert, and if it's not amplified, you will not hear her lips smacking. You will hear only that when you are within kissing distance. So, so you are getting tons of details that, that are not natural, that are not there. Because if you hear... Uh, sounds that can, that are at a at a at an intimate level and then when when she starts uh, singing at at her full voice then that would be at such high dynamic range that you will would go deaf so there is uh, also quite a bit of uh, compression involved with those types of recordings and even if they do not put any compression on it the the microphone will compress enough so, so we do not need to put a, a, a compression plugin or a compressor on a recorded material to compress it. Uh, microphones have a natural compression to them as well. And, and they are not picking up the true dynamic range of, uh, of any performance or any instrument or vocal. So basically, if you, if you follow the road to complexity, uh, then you you will have a full control over the sound. You will uh, keep every aspect under control, and you will get a sound which which sounds perfect. But but it's it's really an illusion of perfection because it it's kind of like uh, entering into a dream world, and it's extremely it's it's a fantastic experience. So if you ever heard the Wilson audio speakers then you know what I'm talking about. You enter into a new reality, which is crafted for you and sculpted for you. And let's look at more of that. Uh, so eventually, I'm, I have here for you guys uh, uh, some examples for both of these classes. So on the right side, we have uh, a Wilson Audio Chronosonic that uh, that is i think the best example for a complex speaker you have uh, i i mean it has uh, multiple drivers like one up here then one more unit mid-range unit and more and more and in here we have two woofers plus a big nice slot port uh, above that line so I, I really like that the idea that they are using slot ports. It's much, much better than the wimpy circular sphincters they, they stick in the butt of speakers. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> as Paul McGowan says that speakers fart, and that's because they have these tiny sphincters and they have to squeeze through that big, huge, deep frequency through that tiny sphincter basically but here in this case uh, Dave builds a new his craft so he put a really nice big slot port so thank you Dave <laughs> you you did the right thing and uh, you showed an example to other manufacturers <laughs> finally thank you <laughs> uh, poor Dave he already passed away and then he's listening to us from above and uh, I would just like to thank him for uh, creating a uh, such a masterpiece for us and uh, and he did this design because each of the individual drivers carry uh, certain bands of the frequency and uh, and and they are done in this fashion because you can adjust each driver separately so they they can aim perfectly at the listener and uh, their distance can be individually uh, adjusted as well 
so you have perfect uh, time alignment so so this is like a true ingenuity and a really different way of thinking than compared to what the crowd does so so that's why he stands up not because he sells his speakers for so much which if you know how much research he needs to put in and and, and the materials cost to to manufacture the cabinet and of course it's not manufactured by the by the tens of thousands so that makes it even more expensive so so he's uh, i believe he's selling these speakers at, at a good price and uh, so so that's what it is and and he has put in uh, a lot of creativity to create it and perfected it so this is like a masterpiece for complexity and what this can give you it can give you really nice frequency extension from extreme lows to extreme highs and it can deliver it at extremely high levels so you can listen to these speakers at really large volumes and they they can uh, work at even in very big rooms so so these are excellent speakers for show but not just show i would say that uh, if you attend uh, live performances with venues which are amplified then uh, these speakers will give you a perfect experience so for example if you go to let's say uh, i'm saying diana crawl again but let's say you go to a diana crawl concert and uh, if if you go there you will not have as good ex experience as listening to uh, the recording through these speakers because at, at at those venues you will hear diana through uh, amplification and speakers at the venue and and these these speakers will give you a, a, a perfect rendering while those speakers will give you an imperfect rendering so 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 this is truly for for all of us who want to go to a, a modern real life concert when there's more like thousand people and it's not in an orchestra if you go uh, to listen to an orchestra then it's better if you uh, choose uh, the other path the simple purist speakers which are uh, on the left side so with these speakers uh, you need to play them in a smaller room they cannot play at extremely high speak uh, sound levels but uh, they they ver they give you a, a tonally more accurate sound and uh, and they they work for unamplified music so they can render like piano well or or a, a sing a vocals well and i have three examples on the top we have the altec valencias which are like really i would say the oldest of these three designs and uh, the cabinet is is not too good but it's, it's it's a decent cabinet but not, nothing special by modern standards but but the special thing about them are the altec drivers and even by today's standards they they are those drivers that have the best tone period and we see also uh, on the bottom left the audio note uh, a and e series speakers which look like uh, doesn't look anything special it looks like something you would uh, pick up at uh, at uh, a used thrift store for a hundred bucks uh, a two-way speaker what's about that it's nothing but what makes it really special is that uh, peter quartrup has gone through uh, iterations and iterations so it's like he has been uh, perfecting these speakers for decades and decades and decades and 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 making minute improvements 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 upon improvements so if you take a single design and you perfect it step by step it's incredible how far you can get because it doesn't matter what kind of speaker concept you use the way it looks like the cabinet and the drivers you put in it will make the difference between a poor speaker and a good speaker but it's only good speaker that's how far you can get by choosing the right drivers and the right cabinets and from good speaker to exceptional speaker 
it's all the tiny details and it's all the crossover and and to get those done you need to have basically the same speaker model and perfect it for decades and decades and decades that's the only way to to create truly exceptional sound and we have here on the bottom uh, uh, the, those speakers, uh, the, the Palcos from Dolce Vita Audio, uh, uh, made by Vincenzo. He he used to make the SAP speakers, and and all of his speakers are are fantastic, uh, really really amazing sounding ones. Uh, this one, the Palco, looks like like an old radio from the 30s or 40s, and it's a single driver speaker. Uh, we, and it also has a, a, a super tweeter on top to, to help it out, but basically it sounds as, as a single driver speaker would, and that's pretty much uh, the ultimate for, for phase response. So as much as the uh, Wilson Audio Chronosonic is the ultimate for frequency response, uh, Vicenzo's Palco is the ultimate for phase response. And I would say the Audio Note ENE is the ultimate of the two-way speakers. And I would say the Altex are, I would say, like a special uh, category on their own. If you haven't heard an Altex speaker, uh, then you don't know what they do. If you heard them, then you say, wow. However, for Altex speakers, uh, the, in the original cabinets, and I would say not even the cabinets, because the cabinets are okay, but but the crossovers need to be severely upgraded to, to give them sound which, which is compatible with modern, modern amplifiers and their modern uh, hearing and requirements. So now let's uh, de dive deep into the Wilson audio sound. Uh, so Dave Wilson, he, he designed uh, these speakers to give uh, a, a specific phase response for each of the units and here I'm, I'm listing them like out of phase with each other but uh, that's just a generic description that's not how uh, he has done it uh, I will not say how he has done it because I don't know how he has done it but uh, I had uh, one chance listening to these speakers and, and then I did notice that, that the units uh, do work in different phases uh, and that time I, 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 I took a mental note how they are, uh, which, which drivers works in, in correct polarity and which driver is in flip polarity, but I didn't write that down and I don't want to write it down. This is their secret and their, their method. And uh, they are doing this because uh, when you flip bands of phases uh, out of sync with each other, then you highlight specific frequency bands so those which are in phase are highlighted and which are out of phase they they sound more ethereal so 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 this this fluctuation between in phase and out of phase gives it a sense of uh, enhanced reality and also for those which are in phase uh, your brain has much more focus on those regions and um, and you will interpret it as as much higher resolution. So so that's that's one of the secrets uh, how uh, Wilson Audio unlocks high resolution is to ha have a really careful uh, phase uh, response. And uh, I do not have any connections with Wilson Audio and <laughs> any connections with Audio not either. So I'm 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 just an independent person uh, just a, a happy audiophile to experience such beautiful things so i do not have any insider information to share you what i have to share is the the, the graphs uh, from stereophile and what my ears tell me when i'm listening to them so basically uh, let's go to our next uh, we have gone through that so what is the compromise to get really high resolution, higher than what is on the recording? Uh, the price to pay is tone. And, and here uh, Bartok, Bela Bartok looks at us like, well, what did you do to my piano? So, so one thing that I noticed when I listened to the Chronosonic is that there was a piano recording on it and the pianist went through 
through the entire keyboard and it sounded as if it was not a single piano but but like every octave sounded as if it was played on a different piano so the tone uh, for for each of the driver units is slightly different and it's partially because they are in phase or out of phase and also because each of the drivers due to its mass or its size and the crossover on it has a different tone so that's the price of complexity uh, but uh, unless you are a pianist you will not need that and, and, and if you really want to have a concert experience what the Wilson audio speakers are made for then it, this is not a priority but if you are like a Bartok buff <laughs> as, as, as Uncle Bela was uh, then uh, then you you will notice that right away uh, and 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 you want to have like a different set of speakers for for your uh, piano or cello recordings so let's go and eventually there's no uh, published data for uh, for the chronosonic speakers on for ste from stereophile and i i believe that's because it's so difficult to measure those speakers partially due to their size and, and the complexity of the drivers that uh, John just couldn't do it. And that's not because he doesn't want to share the information of, with us because there's something fishy about it. I think probably if, if, he, if he does those measurements, I think it will be like, like better than these, what we see here. So here we see the, the frequency response for Wilson Audio Alexia. Uh, we can see them right there and and it's pretty darn good uh, and what we see is um, the region between 500 Hertz to 20 kilohertz is is very nice and uh, flat so let's see if, uh, I, I try to get a pointer for you because it seems that that highlighter didn't really work well on my side so here you see all of this region that's coming from uh, from here to here it's basically flat we see little ups and downs but that's that's really minimal every speaker has a, at least that much ups and downs even more the only thing we have is a blip here but but even that is like 3 db minus <laughs> that, that that's that's really minimal and it covers only uh, a, a tiny range like what is that like around 4 kilohertz maybe like a 500 hertz range so that that's a really minimal coloration up there it's barely noticeable however what is uh, very characteristic here and and what is different from this this noise like uh, spectra here is that we have here a, a dip a, a, a dip and then we have a boost and this is part of uh, Wilson sound so I think if you tuned in for this uh, sh this presentation uh, about Wilson audio sound, this is it. Uh, that that there is a 50 to 80 hertz boost, uh, which is here like a plus 3 dB boost, and then there's a minus 3 dB dip uh, between 200 hertz and 400 hertz, and each of them are relatively small. But when you compare peak to peak, so from here to there you have a 6 dB difference and that's like a four times difference in power so so that's pretty huge so so it means that that if you drive it with one watt and you have a certain level at, at uh, 300 Hertz then 60 Hertz will be as loud as if you pumped in four watts for the speaker and uh, and they do it because this way the, the 50 through 80 hertz region, which is uh, kind of like the meaty part of the bass, that pops out. And they do not pop out this entire region because then it would just sound as bloated bass. So you cannot just that. that this, this is what a boombox would do, just pump up the bass, then this whole thing here would be a huge hill and it would be boom, 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 just boomy. But if you pump this up, and dip it down then it will still sound as as correct for your ear so let's let's see another Wilson speaker the max 3 you can see it here and it also has the same characteristic between 50 and 80 Hertz we have a boost 
which is much bigger than, than with the Alexia, you see, and we have a dip. And the dip is a little earlier, between 100 and 200 hertz, and it's much more pronounced, you see. Here it goes just halfway, and here it goes all the way almost to minus 5 dB. So, so between peak to peak, here we have a 9 dB difference, and here we have peak to peak only 6 dB difference. So this is 4 times the power, but this is 8 times the power. So like 1 watt versus 8 watt, that's, that's how much difference that is. Or, or I would say if you had like a 10 watt amplifier and you drove it and you had certain volume here, the volume here would be as if you had an 80 watt amplifier. And, and here the difference between these two is, is about one octave between uh, those two peaks, so it's, it's a really abrupt change. And for the Alexia it's like uh, two and a half octaves between peak to peak. So this is a much gentler slope and 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 with the max it's it's really maxed out so there you 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 feel this uh, bass punch much more and 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 then the dip is more uh, pronounced however there's another thing you see here we we go deep and and then dip in quite a bit in the upper frequencies between about a, a kilohertz and a half and about six seven kilohertz is and uh, that's called the uh, oh wait not just six seven I think it's more I'm covering the range it's like thirteen kilohertz yeah something like that so so this this part actually basically from two to four kilohertz is called the BBC dip because they realize that uh, if we keep it at this level then most of the recordings sound very harsh. And if we introduce the dip, or maybe a double dip, then it will make most recording much more tolerable for the human ear. Uh, so why couldn't Dave Wilson make up his mind and just, okay, put in the dip or, or not put in the dip? It's because each of us, we have different hearings. So if you are young, like for example, a kid, a woman, or a young man, probably years, 30 or less or sometimes even at, at a teenage age we lose our hearing quite a bit so as men we are really unfortunate but if you are a man and you have your hearing intact or you are a woman or children then the BBC dip is mandatory for you because if you reproduce anything with the same level as it was recorded at the high frequencies it would be really shrill for you and it would be make your ears ache and it would be really painful. So, so that's why BBC invented this dip thing to drop down the high levels because then it will be tolerable for ear. And I believe this is because uh, the microphone's distortion, they, they are more efficient in this region because look at the microphone size, they are this tiny. So they, they work best in this frequency range. They pick up more information here than here. So of course we have to dip them. But if your ear is compromised because of age, bad genetics or, or noise exposure, then you need a boost. And, and the boost is, uh, is right here. So you can pick, choose or uh, pick your speaker depending on your ear. That's, that's not the characteristic reason sound. But the characteristic reason sound is this 50 to 80 boost and then followed by a dip. 50 to 80 boost followed by the dip. And that's true for all of them. Now let's see the breakdown of the drivers. We see the tweeter here and the tweeter has this notch inside. So I think that's, that's uh, let me see, that's around 4 kilohertz. So that's, that's roughly around the size of the, of the face plate where the tweeter unit is so that's that's probably uh, due to to a buffer step uh, that that's wh why it shows up in the response and from here we see this is where the crossover kicks in and response start to drop and here we have that blip because that's where there's a resonant frequency for the tweeter and that's what we don't want to hear that's why they are dropping it at such a steep rate and we have uh, for the green, this is the mid-range unit. 
and the mid-range unit works best between like 100 hertz to a kilohertz that's what mid-range units are for and then he is dropping it down with with a crossover and you see that there's like a sudden rise in the peak and you see that sudden rise because we are using like a second order crossover or higher and when you use that because of the inductance and capacitance working together they give an extra charge extra boost right before the frequency starts to drop so if it was just the first order filter then it would look much more like this and drop like that so but then here we would see drop like this instead we see a drop like that so it means a higher order filter was used and then we see these things these are the cone breakups that's why we want to put a crossover on our mid-range unit to prevent these from being at high level and making a nasty sound so so that's that's a good thing and and then the hard part is to meet make this meet that because their their levels add up so it's not just like okay i just crossed over my speakers at uh, 1.5 kilohertz it doesn't work like that so if you if you uh, put in a 1.5 kilohertz for mid-range unit uh, low pass 1.5 kilohertz high pass for the tweeter you will get a pretty shitty uh, result because you have to experiment how their sound adds up together and and they will not cross at uh, at that frequency where your calculator spits out they will cross because uh, their actual impedance curve is not uh, just a, a fixed value you have to use the exact impedance values to to create to to plot what the drop is and then the drop is never exactly 6 db for first order or, or or let's say like 24 db for fourth order but it's also impacted by the actual impedance changes of the driver so now let's look at this blue curve that's that's the fa that's the output of the woofer and as you see the woofer cone has a breakup resonance here which is nicely uh, tuned down with, with the crossover that cuts the response but then here we see that the response is dropping of the unit and it drops down to here and then it starts to rise and it does this drop and rise because there is a port and it's tuned right here so this is where the port is most efficient so the driver doesn't have to work there at all goes on vacation why because here the red port is taking over so you see you see at the region of the vacation our port is the strongest so this is the region where the port is beefy so basically from from about here to here this is where the port works and then from here it starts to drop naturally so there's no crossover on the port <laughs> Uh, it's uh, this is natural so the port output just drops above a frequency so the port is basically a window between the insides of your speaker cabinet and your room and the window is open between here and here and this window is defined by the port tuning frequency so what did i want to show with this uh, basically some some things here uh, how we can correlate the individual uh, responses to the full output so you see each of the drivers and the port they do their own thing and uh, and you and, and and the job of dave wilson was to put all these these messy things together to create this beautiful fantastic uh, flat response so you see this is the job that speaker manufacturers have to do to create such a flat line from such a big mass and and part of how you can do that is uh, if you flip the phase of the mid-range unit then it's easier to meet the the edges and that's what some speaker manufacturers do because out of necessity but here's an audio does it to sculpt the sound and then make really sp special effect make to create the wheels on sound so basically if you look at the alexia 
these are the regions where we have the crossover regions between 100 hertz and 200 and 1000 and 2000 hertz and for and the rest of them you can hear this is the the uh, the base unit and the port and then from here this is the mid-range unit and from here this is the tweeter and these regions this is mid-range unit plus tweeter both of them contribute and here base unit and mid-range unit both contribute and and breaking it down so the port works between 15 to 35 hertz the woofer works between 35 to 150 mid-range works between 150 to 1.5k and 1.5k up it's the tweeter's job and now let's look at the uh, electrical uh, parameters the impedance curves so this is the impedance curve of the Alexia, this line here. And, and we see this is the scale from 2 ohms up to 20 ohms and from 10 hertz up to 50 kilohertz. And we see that it, if at 10 hertz we have about 6 ohms and goes up to 8, dives to 3 and then goes up to 6, dives to 2 ohm and then it goes up. And the impedance phase, let's look at the impedance phase, impedance phase here that's that's the zero degrees and we can see the scale of, for the y-axis here plus 90 degrees to minus 90 degrees for phase so this line here is the zero it means this is perfect phase so if ever, if the dotted line was here it means that your speaker can use 100 percent of the power that your amp throws at it so if it's not uh, exactly that it means that the speaker sees less power at certain frequencies so at one kilohertz it's where the speaker sees full power and then we go here about 80 hertz uh, it sees full power and then what is here let's see 20 30 40 hertz it sees full power and about uh, 25 hertz or so full power again and then around 12 hertz full power so they, these are these points and then it oscillates between a little more, little less, little more, little less. So, so actually this is an extremely benign uh, impedance phase curve. So it's like close to zero, under 30 degrees basically for most of the time. And here there's only one dip that goes below uh, 30 degrees phase. But other than that, this, this is a really... As, as Freddie Mercury says, like, yeah, show must go on. So actually, it, it's a really happy moment because it means that it's really easy to drive. However, easy to drive for those amplifiers that put out current. So it means that solid state amplifiers will be super happy driving these speakers because they can dump current at the speaker and the and the speaker will lap up current so it lives on current so that's what the impedance phase tells you that that solid state amps are welcome we are built to be driven by dan d'agostino amps and uh best labs <laughs> shout out uh, yep so so actually it's it's like super benign but 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 oh actually before we go to the but let's look at uh, at certain things that you can read from here uh, when you look at the impedance curve you see there is a peak for the impedance uh, that that's at 42 hertz so it means that that's the self-resonant frequency of the woofer so the woofer self-resonant frequency in real life if you just take it out of the cabinet would be much lower than this but if you put it in a cabinet, then the cabinet uh, increases it. And uh, basically this shows uh, that frequency where, where your driver is, is most efficient. Uh, and it, it, can, it can really look at that. It's at uh, 42. It's, it's basically, if you go there, it's really close to zero degrees. So it means that, that for the self-resonant uh, peak, you are at a region, crossing over at a region uh, where, where your driver can lap up a lot of current. Um, and if you go below this peak, this is the dip, this is the port. 
this is define the port uh, so actually it means that from here here your driver works the hardest and as you dip your driver starts to uh, weaken and weaken a cone excursion becomes smaller and smaller and when we go here this is the minimum for cone excursion so even though we are at 20 hertz your speaker driver moves the tiniest bit at 20 hertz and if you go back here to uh, 42 hertz your drivers will be moving uh, i mean the woofers will be moving like this and at the same volume at 20 hertz you won't see any movement at all because there uh, the the port is most efficient and the port is taking over the output and as as, as the impedance starts to increase it's because the uh, the port is start to run out of juice and and when we see the impedance peak there that's where the port stops working so basically this is like a hard stop that's that's the break this is the end of the lower end extension of the speaker and when we go here so this is where uh, the cone excursion starts to drop because the driver can couple more efficiently to air but then as we near uh, the crossover uh, it, the impedance starts to rise and that's also partly because of the inductance of your woofer cone and then uh, here around 1k one and a half so this shows like another crossover there and and you see the rise as uh, as as your your tweeter unit starts to uh, rise in impedance so so we were really happy uh, that that the impedance phase was super benign for uh, solid state amps but check out the this curve that shows the impedance and for the impedance it, it's a mr bean moment because check it out between basically 60 hertz to 150 hertz this is close to 2 ohms load and while you see if, if we would see like the average is about 6 ohms or, or so then it dips to, to 2 ohms so it's, it literally means that this is the death spell for, for most amplifiers uh, even for many solid state amplifiers this is like uh, saying that it won't work with these speakers but for basically all tube amplifiers this is a death path so it means that forget tube amps because check out tube amps have no two ohm taps and uh, and and these speakers thrive on current and tube amps generate voltage so tube amps have voltage output so they can handle very high resistive peaks so if, if here we would see these that black line going up here 20 ohms maybe 50 ohms and come back from there it's it's peanuts your your tube amp can handle that but all solid state amps would poop out seeing that kind of peaks peaks but here uh, we have these really low impedance curves and that also tells us that we need uh, amplifiers that thrive on current so basically that's uh, that's what i wanted to say for for now for our analysis for the wilson audio speakers and the wilson sound uh, basically using uh, your the drivers the bass drivers uh, to tune the ports to really low frequencies and to have that 50 to 80 hertz boost and then the dip at the octave above and and to have them work at uh, a very good uh, impedance phase so that it's a very solid state amplifier friendly and super low impedances so that that you can dump loads of current on it so so that those amplifiers will be very happy driving them in the future episodes we will look at uh, an audio note speaker the A and E series LX signature. This is the one that Stereophile provided uh, measurements for. That's why I'm looking at it. We look at two Wanderstein two series speakers because Stereophile provided measurements for the old C and the new CE. So we look at the Wanderstein sound, how what he does, what makes it special, and I will also make an episode on the Altec 515C 
in the voice of the Lancelot uh, cabinet. And that's because uh, many people are interested in the 515C. It's regarded as the best base driver on the planet. Many say that. But when you look into 515C, you just see, oh, this is the best ever. But no one <laughs> builds speakers with them. And I, I just got really fed up with this, so I built a cabinet with 515C. And I, I will share my, my experience and my measurements on those cabinets uh, for, for you guys, so you can also build your own cabinets. And for everyone else, so you, you learn more, you know more about how to interpret these figures that you see, that you are more conscious about not just phase, uh, not just frequency response, but about the phase response of these speakers and how you can choose for speakers for your purposes. And and thank you for uh, watching uh, my my episode and my my channel my my videos. If you want to learn more, check out my other stuff. And thank you for supporting me. If you click like then uh, YouTube will show this video uh, to people who just search randomly on the internet for audio stuff. If you don't click like, YouTube will not show it up randomly to anyone. So it will stay an anonymous video. So thank you everyone for your audience. Goodbye.